expert on Islam or Muslims, um, nor on the movement, although I have tried over the last decades to learn <coughs> about it, from it, and to be engaged with it. My own professorship is in interreligious relations with an emphasis on the relationships between religion, state, and society. And in my normal professional work, I work in the non-confessional study of religion. But in personal conviction, I am a person who tries to walk in the way of Jesus of Nazareth um, within the Baptist tradition of Christianity. So hopefully that will help you understand <coughs> where I come from in what I have to say. And the first thing I'd like to say, I think on behalf of you all, the organisers haven't asked me to do this, but somebody has to say it, is a word of thanks to those who've organised this conference, the two institutions supporting it, and all of those who put a lot of work into it. So I'm going to invite you now just to give a hearty <laughs> is not only for the warmth of the hospitality, especially for those of us who are speakers, and some of us had the lovely opportunity of floating down the Amsterdam canals last night, but it's because of the importance of the topics we've been engaging, <coughs> the opportunity for intellectual engagement around understanding the volunteers' movement. And it's very important that we do that, we're doing that, in this place, the Netherlands at this time. Perhaps as an outsider, it's sometimes difficult to say something, sometimes it's easier to say something. I come from another country within the European Union in which we all have co-responsibility, that's part of the project, to which we're sort of signed up in the United Kingdom. The Netherlands has a very distinguished history to many of us from outside of religious tolerance and welcome. My own Baptist Christian forebears who could not find a place of religious freedom in the state church context in England in the 17th century came here and in 1609 founded the first Baptist, English Baptist congregation. <coughs> Two ordinary people called Thomas Smith, John Smith and Thomas Helvis. 1609 in a baker's shop here in Amsterdam from which a significant Christian movement thereafter grew. In this country also, in the last century, a resistance was important to a racist ideology that targeted Jewish people with anti-Semitic practice. As our opening speaker reminded us, there's a context of change relative to that inheritance. The Netherlands and other countries in Europe stand poised between inheritances of that <coughs> and uncertain futures in which we all have choices to make. And because of that, this conference and what it's been looking at isn't only about abstract ideas or dilettante academic discourse but has been about the importance of intellectual understanding in a socially engaged way. This conference's focus has been important because how Muslims are seen and how Muslims are treated by others, as well as how Muslims themselves behave and how Muslims themselves project themselves in European society is so critical to our shared European future. In Europe, Islam is the largest minority religion, and Muslims of Turkish ethnic and national heritage and origin are very substantially important within that. And Turkey itself is of great significance as a Eurasian <coughs> cultural, political, and economic bridge that itself poses important questions for the future of how Europe might see itself and its role and its self-understanding in the future. 
So the themes with which we have been concerned are of great practical and policy importance as well as of religious significance. Now coming at the end of a conference of this kind and being asked to make <coughs> closing remarks, it can be seen to be the role to say in a different way what others have already said. Well, I'm not going to try and do that because my colleagues have said it very clearly. And what's even better, thanks to the organisers of this conference, is that you can read in full the papers to which they alluded in their short presentations because they were gathered together beforehand and thank you for undertaking that role which allows us to go away with the resources <coughs> and to study and engage them beyond today. And I also don't think I can give a better overview uh, than Dr. Ergill gave in the first presentation of the day. I'd like just to quote something from him about his perception on the development of what we've been concerned with here. He spoke of it as this. A group of listeners, remember where we started at the beginning of the day, a group of listeners that have become followers, have transformed into being a local congregation, a <coughs> congregation growing into a national community, a community expanding to be a comprehensive international organization of volunteers and stakeholders, that can neither be defined as a religious sect or denomination, although it is religiously informed. And I think there's a lot in those few lines, and I'd encourage you to look at that um, in the presentation afterwards. In terms of other presentations, Dr. Falkenberg reminded us of the importance and difficulty of the tension between language used on the inside of groups <coughs> and language used on the outside of groups. I was recently attending a Christian service of worship where a hymn which had the words, fight the good fight with all your might. And one could quote other well-known Christian hymns of English provenance, onward Christian soldiers or Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. When these words are heard outside the context of the worship in which they take place, how are they heard? If such words were sung by Muslims, with Muslim terminology in place, how would the wider society receive them? Of course, it is important for self-reflection in each tradition to ask, actually, even in our own circles. What are we doing when we're using some of that terminology? Is that right? But it's all too easy to mishear things inside and outside. And very important for all communities is the task of trying to translate faithfully between our internal shorthand that we use among one another <coughs> inside groups and our external communication with others. And to do that in a way that is as faithful as possible and is as full of integrity as possible in making that translational effort. And it's a task for all, not only for Muslims, but it is a task for Muslims too. And it's one in which I think the movement is engaged, hasn't solved all the issues, but further engagement is required. Secondly, Father Michel, and I use <coughs> Father Vitt there deliberately, has reminded us of the theological dimensions of the movement, and in particular of Fethullah Gulen's own teaching and inspiration to the movement. He emphasized, and here I quote, the role as spiritual director and teacher of an internalized Islamic virtue. For Gulen, he says, spirituality must always be oriented towards the service of God and others. Another quotation, God rewards a small act done with purity of intention more highly than many ostentatious deeds done without the sincere desire 
to serve God alone. Now at this moment I'm going to abandon normal Western academic conventions and speak a little bit personally. Because I think in order to understand this movement, one has to understand the personal dimensions of it and how that relates to people who come into contact with the movement. And it's a kind of personal that's not a free-floating personal, but is rooted in that strong belief in dependence upon and renewal by whatever it is that we call the divine. And so I'll speak personally in relation to that, not to display anything in relation to myself, but because it's important to understand. During this last year, uh, my wife was seriously ill with what turned out to be a terminal illness, and she died in July. Peace beyond her and light eternal for her. During that time, People within the movement, I know, <coughs> prayed for her and for me. Ritual prayers, multiple times, multiple times prayers, whatever it was, okay, that's also part of it, as well as the public service. They sent SMS texts using modern media. It was great to receive such things and know that people were thinking of one in a very difficult personal circumstance. They came to visit the hospital and spent time just sitting with us as my wife knew she was going to die. She died a Christian, in fact in the Catholic tradition, having received the communion of the sick and with a rosary round her neck. There was no imposition from our Muslim friends who came to visit. There was only that shared human concern. Although we did ask, actually, would they be kind enough to recite the Quran for us too? And they did. And after she died and we had a service of thanksgiving, one good friend travelled also from a personal bereavement all the way back from Turkey to arrive straight into the service of thanksgiving to speak as a Muslim and to offer prayer and thanksgiving. I share this with you because it is the case we need to understand this movement in relation to issues of social capital, social cohesion, and so on, which we'll just come to in a, in a few moments. But without understanding something of what I've just been trying to communicate to you, you will not understand what lies at the heart of those who are inspired by the teaching of Fethullah Gulen. So, I hope that's something to take away.